So good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome back from spring break. I hope everybody had a good time and uh, you know have some interesting memories that you can talk about without getting yourselves indicted. Um, I've got a few of those myself. We're starting today on the new unit, and we're going to be talking about solutions. Now, solutions is something that we mentioned back at the start of the year when we were talking about classifying matter. It was one of those classifications of matter. Um, we're coming back to it because there's quite a bit of chemistry that deals exclusively with solutions. Um, solutions lead into acids and bases, which is where we go from here. There's also a lot of ties between solutions and gas chemistry, which is where we're going to be going after that. So everything we're going to be doing here and talking about today ties in with pretty much everything we do the rest of the year, except maybe nuclear. Nuclear is kind of its own thing. So what we're going to be doing, we're going to be using this mind map. And as we use this mind map, we're going to kind of color bits and pieces of it in as we talk about stuff. And so you're going to be coloring stuff. You're going to be adding a few notes in and around things as I add notes in and around things, as well as uh, if you need more space to write stuff down, you can, of course, write on the back or write on your own paper. But this is pretty much going to be your notes for today and tomorrow. Okay. Well, we're going to start uh, talking about, first of all, what a solution is. And uh, just kind of jog your memory. Uh, let's start off here by coloring our, I'm just going to color an S. You know, it's a nice place to start. So we need to get a good definition for what a solution is. And I'm going to get that right down here. Uh, definition for a solution, a solution is a physical mixture of two or more substances. Okay? So I'm going to kind of jot down definition. I can't read my handwriting, I apologize. But, so a physical mixture of two or more substances. Now if it's a physical mixture, that means that it's not what? What's the opposite of physical? No, that's a different kind of opposite. I'm thinking more in the context of chemistry. We have physical changes or chemical. chemical, okay? So it's not a chemical mixture. We're not making, when we mix stuff up, we're not making new compounds. We're not putting together things with new chemical formulas. It is just strictly a physical mixture. And so our little picture to go with that, down here we got a blender, right? So I'm gonna get myself a nice blender color. Oh, chrome. Those expensive blenders. Some nice red buttons there because you know you gotta have red buttons. Nice red right, come up a little here too. Uh, Y'all ever use a blender? Yeah. Okay, what are some things you toss in a blender? Fruit. You can toss in fruit, bananas, ice, ice, ice cream. Ice cream. Oh, it sounds like you guys are making smoothies. Mm -hmm. Dude, who loves them a nice real fruit smoothie? Anybody? Yeah, I'm not a fan of yogurt usually, but if you kind of hide yogurt in a smoothie, I'm okay with it. Love myself a nice fruit smoothie. And in this fruit smoothie, looks like maybe we got, well, I don't know, banana, peel and all, apparently. Uh, you might have, you know, maybe big chunky raspberries. You know, I'm, I'm going to be healthy, so I'm going to maybe throw in a, yeah, perfect. Maybe a big green leaf of spinach in there. And then I'm going to, Maybe toss in some uh, tasty, oh, I don't know, probably some milk, right? You know, I like to use almond milk for that, it tastes better. Anyway, we're going to toss it in there, we're going to hit blend, and what's going to happen to all the stuff we got in that blender? It's going to mix. Now, if I blend it long enough, and if I've got an expensive enough blender, and we're going to say that this one's really expensive, you know, because it's all bright and shiny here. Ooh. Check out how expensive that is. Um, after a while, it's going to mix it so well that I'm not going to be able to tell it's even a mixture, right? Mm -hmm. It's going to look like a single substance. I'm going to look high and low for little chunks of banana or something. I'm not going to be able to find them because this blender is the best blender ever. This is the Donald Trump blender, okay? Um, blend, I don't know, makes smoothies great again or something. Uh, 
So anyway, I've got all these substances mixed, and they are mixed so well that I'm going to come up here, and I'm going to go ahead and tell her another letter in my solution. I'm going to call it the letter O, if my crayon thing works. My daughter gave me these crayons. I think it's because she doesn't like them, because they don't work for her either. Um, but I'm going to come over, and I'm going to talk about, more specifically, what kind of mixture I've got here. And the kind of mixture I've got here is a homogeneous mixture, not a heterogeneous mixture. Okay? And so the word homogeneous, I know you've heard before. What does that word mean? Single. No, that would be monogeneous. Oh, same. Same. Okay. Because the uh, root homo it out of your system means same. Okay? When I have a homogeneous mixture, it is the same throughout. Okay? Specifically, um, what that means is it is all existing in a single state of matter. Okay? Uh, Back when we first learned about this, we learned that it's a single state of matter that does not have any phase boundary, meaning that it's not like I've got liquid drops floating in liquid. It's not like a lava lamp or something. There are no boundaries. It is all perfectly bended all the way through. And what do they have in our little picture right here? Milk. They got milk, right? See, it's milk. Um, because you've heard of homogenized milk, right? Milk is a mixture, but when it's homogenized, it is mixed so well that you can't tell it's a mixture anymore. It looks like a single substance. Now, what about this dude down here at the bottom? What do we have down there? Chocolate chip cookie. Looks like a chocolate chip cookie, right? Mm. I'm going to color my cookie here. Okay. There's my chocolate chip cookie. Now, when you look at a chocolate chip cookie, can you tell it's a mixture? Yeah. Because you can see the chocolate chips. By the way, what's the best cookie ever? Chocolate. I mean, it's good. I don't know that I'd say it's the best ever. What do y'all honestly think? I'm hearing white chocolate macadamia. Not that one's good. Yeah. Uh, you been in here like snickerdoodles? Yes. Okay. I used to. Um, I think my favorite is probably a peanut butter cookie, but it's got one of those Hershey's Kisses like melted in the middle of it kind of thing. Oh, dude. Is it Boston Boston? I, I don't know what that means. But it's, it's a good cookie. But anyway, when you've got a mixture and you can tell it's a mixture, then it's heterogeneous. And so we're not talking about a heterogeneous mixture. We're talking about a homogeneous mixture. Homogeneous like milk, not heterogeneous like cookies. Okay? So, so far we've got a solution. It's a physical mixture of two or more substances mixed homogeneously. Now, this is going to be some slightly new information here. Let's go ahead and color our L in solutions here. And I'm going to give it a nice bright blue. Because I'm going to need the nice bright blue for this next part where we talk about a solvent and a solute. And I'm going to color my solvent blue. Because a really good example of a solvent, and one that most people tend to think of, is that right there. What is that a picture of? Water. That's water, right? Okay. And so I've got you know, some water here. And I'm going to say over here, oh, I don't know what that is. Looks kind of chunky. Let's let's get some colors for it. Um, no, I'm, I'm just going to make it orange. I'm, I'm going to say that this right here, there's some little uh, chunks of Kool-Aid pot. Okay. So I'm going to color solute with that. Wow, really bright green and orange. Okay. And so in order to make a solution, I have to have two parts. I have to have a solvent, and I have to have a solute. Okay. Some people pronounce it solute. Some people pronounce it salute. I think mm -hmm. salute is more like stand up straight and put your hand on your head. Okay. But some folks pronounce it salute. And it doesn't really matter that much, I guess. But based on the picture here, can you tell me 
What is a solvent and what is a solute and how are they related to each other? The only wrong answer is the one you don't try. Come on, I got water, I got two aids. Tell me what happens when I put them together. The Kool-Aid dissolves. Now, I'm going to ask you a silly question, but it's a serious one. Does the Kool-Aid dissolve the water, or does the water dissolve the Kool-Aid? The water dissolves the Kool-Aid. Everybody in agreement on that? Yes. Okay, very good. So that's all you need to know for our definitions for solvent and solute. Let's go ahead and get a definition for them. So a solvent is the thing that does the dissolving. And the solute is the thing that gets dissolved. Does that make sense? Okay. So aside from Kool-Aid and water, can you think of any other solvent and solute examples? Okay. Sugar. What do you dissolve sugar in? Water. You can dissolve it in water. Anybody in here like sweet tea? Okay, I'm not going to judge, but y'all probably dissolve sugar in tea, right? To make sweet tea. Okay, that would be a solvent solute combination. Are all solvents liquids and are all solutes solids? Absolutely not. Are you saying no because that seems like an obvious question? Yeah. yeah. So that's true. Solvents and solutes can be all kinds of things. You can have liquid solvents and liquid solutes. You can have sol solid solvents. And solid solutes, having the solid dissolved in the solid, you can have gases dissolved in gases. You can have a liquid dissolved in gas. You can have a gas dissolved in a liquid. You can even have a liquid dissolved in a solid. Okay? All these are possible uh, combinations. The only one that I don't think you can have is I don't believe you can have a solid dissolved in gas. I'm pretty sure that's not a thing because the solid just falls out of gas. But... I want to talk about a couple more things here. I want to show you an example of what I'm talking about. So, now the reason why I picked water out here and why this is blue is because water is kind of special. Okay, so I'm going to make myself a little arrow up here. I'm going to make a little note that water, or H2O, is sometimes referred to as the universal solvent. That's not because water can dissolve the universe. What do I mean by universal? The universal. No, that would be bidirectional. It can dissolve a lot of stuff. Yeah. Okay. It dissolves a lot of things. A lot of stuff dissolves in water, right? Except the stuff that don't. But a lot of stuff does. And so you know, it's earned the nickname universal solvent because it can dissolve almost anything. Uh, this is really important for life. I mean, you guys knew water is important for living things. But the main reason water is important for living things isn't just because they get thirsty. It's because, if you think about living things, what are all living things made up of? What's the basic unit of life? Nope. Water's not alive. I'm thinking bigger than matter, bigger than water. It's a little tiny unit that you know, has parts in it. A cell, right? Y'all remember talking about those way back when? Okay. So... I've mentioned before that biology is really just a big branch of chemistry because all that living things are are little bags of chemicals behaving strangely when you get right down to it. Anything a living thing does, think about all the things you do. Okay, Digesting your food, moving, uh, maintaining your boundaries, stimulus and response, all of those different hallmarks of life only happen because of chemical reactions happening inside of your cells whether you're you, whether you're a tree, or a blue whale, or a bacteria. It's the same. You're all about chemical reactions. And every chemical reaction that I can think of has to happen in an aquatic environment. Every chemical change that happens inside your cells happens in a water solution. It's stuff dissolved in water interacting with other stuff. Okay? You've got no water, you got no reactions, you got no life. So it's kind of a big deal. Um, let's drift over here and let's do another letter. Let's go ahead and color the letter U. Huh, let's pick the color I haven't done before. This looks like a nice, oh, that's almost a red. Okay. 
So I'm going to come down here and I'm going to talk about what happens if you've got a mixture that's not a solution. Okay? So if something is not a solution, wow, expert coloring. Check that out. Thing of beauty is a joy forever. So if it's not a solution, but it's still a mixture, then it can be one of two things. And we talked about these way back at the start of the year too, right? It could be a suspension or it could be a colloid. Now the big difference between those and a suspension, you got big chunks. Which is funny no matter who says it. Okay? And a colloid, you got small chunks. But you can't really tell just by looking at it that it's not a solution until you do what to it. And we did this in the lab. What's it being shot with there? Light. Uh, laser. Right. It's being shot with light. Okay. In this case, it's being shot with a laser light. So this laser light is hitting this and it's being scattered by all the chunks in there that you couldn't see until you hit them with the light. Remember, we call that the tindal effect. All the things you tested for when we did the lab and you were trying to classify all those little pieces of matter way back when. Seems like forever ago. So, these guys down here would both be heterogeneous mixtures. Okay? Which means that they are not solutions. Come over to the right hand side here. We got this big old arrow. We got some little cartoon dudes. Okay, so our big old arrow here, click that. You know what? It looks like one. It's not. We'll talk about it. So this big arrow right here is how we talk about the strength of a solution. Okay, so down at this end, we're going to have weak solutions. Up at this end, we're going to have strong solutions. Okay. And the term that we use for that, we're going to color another letter in our map right here. Let's pick something out we haven't done yet. How about a green? Got a light green right here. So I'm going to color the letter T. I'm going to follow it up here. Oops. And that's going to bring me to this word right here. Concentration. I'm going to color my brackets real nice, and then I'm going to be lazy and just kind of shade all my letters because I don't want to color all that. Have I ever told y'all about my kindergarten teacher? Yes. Mm -hmm. Have I? What did I tell you? Yeah. Yes. She, she thought, I mean, she legit thought I was like mentally handicapped. I mean, she wrote a letter to my parents expressing her concern. So, you know, Ms. Watkins, if you're watching this, you're right. Um, but anyway, we're going to come over here, and that's going to bring us over to this arrow. Now I'm going to do something with this arrow. I'm going to start at the bottom, and I'm going to color it kind of weak, and I'm going to push a little bit harder as I get going further up, and I'm going to push a little bit harder as I get going further up until I am coloring really, really, really hard all the way up here at the top. Really, really hard. Okay. And lighter as we go down. What we're talking about here is we're talking about concentration. We're going to start with this little guy down here at the bottom who's definitely not a cigarette butt. Let me add a little bit of color to him and maybe you can tell me a little bit more what he is. Any ideas? He's a... He's a test tube, right? Like he's a test tube with hair, apparently. Uh, now, how does he look to you? He looks a little bit sad to me, too. Now, what could possibly make a test tube sad? Look at where, what end of the arrow he's at. He's unsaturated. He's unsaturated. What is that? He's not full. He's not full. Okay? So, let me, let me give you a case in point. Let's say that... Now, I'll call it a little light down here. Almost so light you can't see it out there. Let's say that I take some salt and I take some water and I take just a little pinch of salt, drop it in that water, and boom, I got salt water, right? I mean, all the ingredients are there. Now, if I taste that salt water, is it going to taste very strong? No. No. Could I dissolve more salt in it if I wanted to? Yes. 
Okay, so that's what unsaturated means. Unsaturated means more solutes can be dissolved. In other words, this poor guy is not full. Okay, that's why he looks so sad. So if I'm dissolving something inside there, now if it's a real solution, you wouldn't be able to see particles. That's just kind of showing showing you that they're there. But if I keep adding salt to my salt water and it keeps dissolving, I'll add a little bit more, it keeps dissolving. After a while, I'm going to add so much that I'm going to put in one pinch too many, and guess what? That last little pinch is not going to dissolve. I can stir it like crazy all I want to, but there's going to be a chunk of stuff that's sitting at the bottom of that test tube that will not dissolve anymore. Okay? So we come to this dude right here. Okay, what can you tell me about him? He's a little bit fuller, right? Okay. In fact, does it look like he could eat anything else? Do you? I don't think there's even room for dessert. I think he's as full as he's going to get. Go ahead and you know, add a little bit of flavor color to his uh, environment here. I'm sitting in my orange shirt. Oh, do I want to get any brown? Okay. Yes, brown shirt. Okay. And he's been eating whatever he's been eating. He's been eating solute. And now he is full. He couldn't possibly stomach another bite. Okay? So I'm here beside saturated. We're going to say that no more solute can be dissolved. Okay? He's full. Couldn't eat another bite. In fact, there's still going to be some chunks sitting at the bottom that won't at all, bless you, no matter how long you stare at them, no matter how much you stir them. They're going to stay undissolved. Now, if that's the end of the story, then, then, then how do you uh, explain uh, Captain Marvel up there? You stir it and then you add more. But I just told you if I stir it, it's still not going to dissolve. But you're, I like the way you're thinking. Uh, you force it now. You do kind of force it. And let's talk about how that's done. Okay. Some of y'all told me a while ago you like drinking sweet tea, right? Okay. So uh, let's say that you get some tea and, oh, heaven forbid, it's not sweet. And you're like, ah, oh, this tastes like leaf water. So I'm going to fix this. I'm going to add some sugar. So you pour some sugar in your sweet tea and you stir it. And then you look in your tea glass. And what do you see at the bottom? There's a lot, sure. It's not dissolved, right? So you really want it to dissolve. So you stir and stir and stir and stir, but it's still not dissolving. So how else could you get that sugar to dissolve? So 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 what? Okay, I, I think maybe everybody's talking at the same time. I'm sure somebody said the right answer, but I'm not sure. Say again. You heat it up. If you heat your tea, will more sugar dissolve in it? Or even better, if you start with hot tea and you sugar it then and then cool it back off, it's sweet, right? Yeah. Okay, so you're agreeing with me that stuff dissolves better, like sugar dissolves in water better if the water's hot? Okay, so let's say that I take my already full little test tube, full of solute here, and I heat him up a little bit, and lo and behold, that little bit of sugar or salt at the bottom right there dissolves. So I decide I'm going to push my luck. I put in some more salt. And sure enough, it dissolves. And if I keep heating this up and it's getting hotter and hotter, I can keep adding salt to it and it keeps on dissolving. Now at some point I'm going to get bored or I'm going to run out of whatever I'm heating it up with and it's going to start to cool back off. Now here's the freaky cool thing. When it starts to cool back off, guess what happens to all that solute that I dissolved in there? You'd expect it to grow back, or come back to crystal. It stays off. It shouldn't be able to, but it does. And so when we've got a situation like that, where we've got 
way more solute dissolved in there than we should be able to have dissolved in there. I'm going to pick any darker green here. And we have what's known as a supersaturated solution. It is super, super strong. In fact, uh, what I'm going to find this is I'm going to say that a supersaturated solution has more solute dissolved than usually possible. at that temperature. So my steps for making a uh, supersaturated solution, we'll go ahead and give him kind of a red trim because yeah, so that's the best color for this. We got three steps basically. First step is we are going to add heat. Next step is we are going to Dissolve more solute. Our last step is we are going to let it cool. Now, so long as we let it cool without disturbing it physically, then that solute will stay dissolved. But here's the really wild thing. If I decide to, like, bump that test tube, you drop a single crystal into that supersaturated solution, all of a sudden those crystals are going to start growing back. Now I've got a really cool example of this, but I don't have it prepped for y'all today because I'm a slacker. I will show you tomorrow, though, and it's really awesome. But I'm going to give you a real world example of this. How many of y'all uh, like honey? Okay, just rain. Everybody else, you like sweet tea, but you don't like honey? Okay, good. So how many of y'all have some honey around the house? Okay, uh, so you keep a little bottle of honey around the house. Does it ever do something weird in the bottle? Oh, does it separate? It, it kind of starts getting chunky, right? Yeah. yeah. Because what's happening is that honey is a super saturated sugar solution made by bees. They take liquid like water. They heat it up with their body heat. They pour as much dissolve sugar into it as possible, then they let it cool back down. When it cools back down, that sugar stays nice and goopy and dissolved. But sometimes it gets physically disturbed, and when that happens, crystals start growing in your honey. Now, if you get crystals in your honey, does that mean your honey's gone bad and you just need to throw it out? What can you do to fix heat it? Heat it. You heat it back up. Now, super important, don't heat it up in the microwave in a plastic bottle. I know this through bitter experience, because hot sugary stuff gets real hot and it will melt your bottle. Okay, then your little Mr. Bear is going to have like, you know, mutant issues or something. It's going to be just all kinds of ugly. Eat it up in glass and don't burn yourself. But that's what folks who like uh, farm bees for honey do. A lot of times they will store uh, excess honey during seasons when they're not selling it really well. They'll just uh, let some of the water out of it or physically disturb it, turn it back to crystals. And then when, you know, it's time to sell it again, they'll heat it back up and re-dissolve it and re-supersaturate it. And you got honey. Another example, uh, kind of along the same lines. Any of y'all ever eat that really fancy rock candy? Like maybe it'll be on a stick and it'll look like big crystals mm -hmm. or on a string. The way they make that is they make a super saturated sugar solution. And they stick a stick in it, pump it. And the crystals will start coming back out of the solution and start growing out. Okay. So we got a couple more words here we need to go over. So if we've got something that's really, really strong, I'm going to put a word right underneath that. Another word for a really strong solution, we say that it is concentrated. Which means we need to have a word for when a uh, solution is really weak. Now, Daniel, did I hear you all ago? I think you said this word. If it was really weak and not concentrated, first the D. No, not quite disturbed. Nope, that's a good D word. Not a band. Decent band. Dilated. Dilute. Okay. Dilated is what happens when your pupils go like that. Dilute is what happens when you got a weak solution. 
So if it's strong, it's concentrated. If it's weak, it's dilute. I'm going to perform what's called a dilution. I'm going to go ahead and color another letter in solutions for this. I'm going to color my letter I. Huh, what have I not used yet? I want to color it. Okay, cool. Okay, I'm going to perform a dilution. And the way I do that is I take, the formula for that is M1D1 equals MCD2. Now M here stands for concentration, okay? M equals molar concentration. What do you think B stands for? Any guesses? And you're absolutely right. Beautiful. Beautiful is not a word. V. Oh. Volume. Very good. So if I want to do a dilution, let's say if I've got 12 molar hydrochloric and I want to change it to 2 molar hydrochloric, let's say I want to make 1 liter of this stuff, then I do 2 times 1, which is 2, which means that 12 times whatever has to also equal 2. So it would be like 12 times 1 sixth, right? Okay. So in other words, I take like 1 sixth of a liter of this stuff, and I dilute it with enough water to make 2 liters, or to make 1 liter, and that would be 2 molar hydrochloric acid. Really easy math. And we're going to stop there for today. Tomorrow we're going to talk about our last three bits having to do with solutions. Thank you so much for your attention. Anybody have any questions? All right. This is a safe place for me.